Live from the San Jose Convention Center, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering Hadoop Summit 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Hortonworks, and by EMC, Pivotal, IBM, Pentaho, Teradata, SyncSort, and by Attunity. When Disc yeah. now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for Hadoop Summit 2015. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out for the events and extract the signals from the noise. I'm John Furrier. My co-host, this segment is Jeff Frick, and our next guest is AJ Anon, VP of Products at Kivos Insights, and Praveen Kankaria, founder of and CEO of Impetus, who was here earlier. Welcome back to theCUBE, and welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about the technology. We had a great conversation around the services and the, the big Fortune 50 companies, these large deployments. Services led, that's great, but now they've got to execute technology. AJ, tell us what's going on with the technology you guys have and how that relates to the challenges that the large enterprises have, because you guys have a unique, scalable product. Right. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we're here at the Hadoop Summit, and you know what Hadoop enables enterprises to do is collect all sorts of data at tremendous volume and uh, you know, bring it all together into the Hadoop uh, quote-unquote data lake. Uh, but the challenge then is how do you make that accessible and, and uh, interactive for the business user? How do they get their hands on their data and get insights from it? And that's what we enable them to do. So we enable a business user to interact directly with the data uh, on Hadoop, uh, you know, visualize it, uh, slice and dice it with interactive instant response even though the data can be at massive scale with massive granularity. So, I want you to explain something for me because I mean, I'm kind of getting the big picture I want to do a drill down is, um, Praveen and I were talking in the previous segment where customers just want solutions and outcomes, right? So, they don't talk in the speeds and fees language of the industry. Um, but when they come here, they say, okay, hey, the old way, I know, I've seen this movie before. Right. I have my big data warehouses and I kind of know what I've inherited. Costs and they know all the costs, the loading, everything else. I don't want that anymore, I want the new way. I want to be open, I want to take advantage of open source, and I want to be able to, to work with data, build apps, deliver some value, and then incrementally transform my, my enterprise. Right. But I don't want a situation where I'm locked into a platform, sure. or tool for that matter. Right. So what, you know, what do they do? Yeah, so what a business user is looking for is self-service interactive analytics on data, regardless of what the size and scale is, right? And without having to depend on somebody else to be doing the programming and right, creating the reports and so forth. So they're used to doing this in an enterprise data warehouse using OLAP tools for doing that interactive analytics. And OLAP is you know, pretty much entrenched in pretty much every enterprise out there and has been there for years, right? Now as you've got the new age of big data coming in uh, and you've got data with tremendous volume and variety, trying to fit that into an existing enterprise data warehouse is, is, doesn't work, right? Because the enterprise data warehouses are pretty structured and inflexible. And in order to make a change to an enterprise data warehouse, you know, it, it pretty much takes an act of Congress with uh, you know, uh, multiple months of effort to make those changes. Hadoop is a much more cost-effective and flexible environment and forgiving environment to bring in all of that data. But they still want to be able to deal with things the same way as yeah. they're, they're comfortable with, with, with you know, the OLAP way of doing a, analysis. And that's what we do. We kind of marry the benefits of OLAP with the scalability and flexibility of Hadoop. So I got to ask you a question, because Amazon uh, has proven this, Amazon Web Services, and we do all their shows too with theCUBE, and, and some interesting use cases come, have come out of this, some of these guys that can literally spin up supercomputers to do massive, whether it's regression analysis, black holes, or some modeling that they could never do before, and highlights the benefits of spinning up massive compute. Okay, good job. With this now, what we're seeing is, I want to do essentially the equivalent of me spinning up massive data warehouse, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to double down on it. I need to see some data, but I need the benefits of scale instantly in a short period of time right. so I can see and analyze, do I have the right connections and formulas and data, and then look at the results and then iterate again. So this is kind of agile meets you know, data warehousing. Is that what you guys do? Can you deliver that holy grail dream? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you're bringing the data in, uh, you don't have to pre-commit to a structure or pre-commit to a schema. You can, you know, interact with the data. You can, you know, build, uh, you know, the OLAP cubes. 
uh, and then get the results right away and then explore the results and look at different dimensions and aspects of the data and, 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 and you can realize, you know, is this the right cube? Do I want to change it? Do I want to create a new one? You have the flexibility to create as many cubes as you want and, and expose them to different kinds of business users or business use cases. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a much more flexible environment than existed with the traditional enterprise data warehouse. I love how OLAP cubes and the cube are all in the same sentence. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's good for our tweeting mojo, get the cube, <laughs> cube out there. No, but the OLAP cube really signifies performance. <clears throat> Talk about that, that use case. What is the OLAP cube for the folks out there that right. understand the magnitude of this scale? Yeah, you know, so if you think about Hadoop, there's kind of two ways of doing things on Hadoop. One is running uh, machine learning algorithms and so forth where you kind of submit those algorithms, come back after a while and you get some kind of result. And the other is, you know, where the, the human aspect of it, where you, the, the business user wants to interact with the data and he wants to be able to follow a train of thought and, and follow it through as he's exploring the data without submitting a query and then going off and getting a cup of coffee, right? Uh, so what we do is give you that instant response time. So even though you're dealing with data at massive scale, this could be billions of records, and, and that's literally true. We've got customers with hundreds of billions of records uh, with uh, you know, dimensions with cardinality in the 100 million plus, uh, 200 million plus range is what they're talking to us about. And you still get the response time within a couple of seconds. Is, you know, that, that's what it's we amazing, deliver. Yeah. And, and nobody else can deliver on that. So talk I mean, about the business impact though, was that guy can, can continue to drill down within seconds. So in terms of following a train of thought and really exploring a hypothesis and changing direction, yeah, it's got to so, be a completely different uh, animal. Right, so the productivity can dramatically increase you know, in terms of what you can do with the data, right? Uh, because, so we've got users who were uh, you know, taking you know, weeks uh, to produce reports and they, you know, they started out with Hadoop and they said, okay, we'll put a hive structure in place and we'll see if that can reduce the time. And okay, so they went from uh, uh, multiple weeks to a few days, but it would still take, you know, you know, a whole day for them to process the reports and get the results they were looking for. With us, you know, we went to the same environment. Within a couple of weeks, we were able to put a, a cube in place. Uh, and now they can interactively create those charts and dashboards and, and make modifications as necessary and iterate on them and, look, and get real value from it instantly. So well, I'll give you a simple example, John. So let's say I'm a consumer company and I want to ana I'm an analyst at a consumer company, uh, a multinational, uh, selling, let's say, soap bars, shampoos, whatnot. I want to analyze. You Lever, Lever Brothers, Procter and Gamble. <laughs> let's say, I mean, let's say, only let's two. Say, let's say, let's say, <laughs> Lever Brothers, or Procter and Gamble. Uh, now, almost every resident of the U.S. is a potential customer or a customer today. Uh, and if somehow I'm profiling, tracking who bought what, using their credit card histories and purchase histories, whatnot, I can actually go in and I can build a queue for the entire U.S. population in one place with absolutely fine-grained information in there. Today, the way what we've discovered is most enterprises, either if they do it at a national level, then it's a very coarse granularity. They don't have, they cannot go down to a single household or an individual in the same queue. Or they'll just go and do it at a state level or a county level or a metro area level. And, and, and. So they've got these disparate systems. Now, yeah. with what Ajay just described, you can just build one queue in a, you know, you can drag and drop and then fire it off on a cheap Hadoop cluster, you know, 300 nodes, 400 nodes, just quickly builds out, and then you can start playing with it, and I can just zoom up to a national level, Praveen, and I can zoom you, down to a household You're hitting level. on a really core thing, which is, you're highlighting the old way, which was limited by technology and resource, not creative thinking, certainly the individuals are <coughs> building cubes, right? I mean, there's a human capital element here. Right. Now with Hadoop, Cloud, and these, technologies with this kind of performance, it makes scale and resource go away. Right. One. Two, now the human role changes. Those outliers which are, wow, well, and if I go drilling down on that outlier, it's going to cost all this money, that outlier actually could be the answer, right? So this is where we get into the kind of the, the weirdness and nuances of data science, right? So what impact do you guys see? One, do you believe that? And two, where does this go from here? I mean, what happens next? I mean, is this transformative, I mean, what? Let, let, let me answer this question by asking you a question, John. Let's switch okay, our, yeah. our roles. <laughs> Love this. So, so between uh, cost of computing, cost of storage, cost of memory, and cost of human time, which is which one is increasing? Increasing cost? Increasing. Talent, of course, yeah. I would say talent. 
Human Cost, talent. talent. Human talent, yeah. right? right? Absolutely. No yeah. more everything, everything else is falling. Yeah. So the way we have designed this is we'll leverage the falling cost of all three, but we want to make sure that the human being is not made to wait. The yeah. human being who's waiting there to, do, to know his or her data doesn't have to wait. You know, that's a good, a good point. This is a good conversation, like how we're kind of real time, you know, riffing on this, but the human capital piece, the most expensive component, yes. is really where the ROI should come into. Yes. So everyone's kind of looking at ROI as kind of justification. We mentioned how do you sell stuff, but when you look at the ROI, whether it's an expensive salesman in the right sales situation with the right person, or using the right resource for the linguistic ontology or, or whatever things get done, that's the ROI piece. So. Is this yet even on the table to, to do ROI on this, or is this ROI still elusive because it's kind of developing? Most people look at ROI like, oh, we invested X and an artifact popped out and we have a sale or it generated revenue, because that's revenue focused, but on the human capital, is there an ROI equation for the human capital at this point? Because that's an interesting comment, because that's like, okay, good, what do we do? So actually, it's a very good question. So there is no direct ROI that, oh, we our analysts saved so much, and, and that will not be enough of a value add for us as a company. Uh, but I think uh, the real benefit is that analyst, before he or she lost interest in pursuing a certain path, pursuing a certain hunch, uh, right, right. was able to arrive at that insight uh, and validate or invalidate that insight and act on it. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is you said, <coughs> The, the concept of sampling, right, gets less and less relevant, right, when you can drill up or drill down. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't so, have a sample. Right, so yeah. we, we actually have a customer, EnterVision, uh, and that is precisely their use case. The, they, they look at, uh, uh, you know, trying to analyze how uh, the Latin population is using different media channels and what their viewing habits are and what the purchasing behavior is. And the way they used to do it before was with self-reported diaries, right? And you know how accurate those can be. And, and surveys and samples. Uh, so they really wanted to move away from that and move to empirical data with, with real transactional numbers behind it and much more precise measurement of what these people were actually doing. And that completely transformed the, the value they could provide to their customers who are targeting these, these channels. Right, right. right. Because now they know precisely where to target them, what the profiles of those customers are, and what the best uh, you know, marketing campaign could be for them. So they went from monitoring 40,000 users a sample of 40,000? Out of how many? To well, uh, so th their uh, population base that they could cover is about 20 million uh, subscribers. Okay, so they were sampling 40,000 on 20 million. Right, and now they can get to you know the e every single user yeah. in that population. It reminds me too, John, of the of the all flash discussion, right? There, there's, the, there's the unit change in going with flash versus spinning disk, but it's the second order impacts of freeing up time, moving everyone's process quicker better replication of the data that, that really opens up a, a completely different ROI than just looking at, uh, I, need a, I need to justify this with a, with a high value application that needs to be low latency. It's really these second order impacts that you, know, you, you, you can't even begin to think how analyst behavior is going to change, discoveries they're going to make, and, and ROI of, of business cases you haven't even necessarily thought of when you move away from sampling into this right. really holistic view. And, and I think the point you were making was instead of being constrained by, by the systems and the you know, memory and, uh, and, and so forth, now, now you completely free up the analyst to explore whatever he wants to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, a decision yeah. maker too, it's a great point. I mean, to yeah. me it's all about the data, right? The outliers which you couldn't get to before right. because of cost and friction, mm -hmm. you can now look at and at least go yay or nay, I want that. Or drill down on it, kind of like that movie Contact with Jodie Foster. It's like in that small piece of space is a big puzzle piece behind it. And that's that's analytics. Yeah, and actually that's exactly what OLAB cubes are meant for, right? So you can take a look at a certain aspect of your data and start drilling down to whatever level of detail you want and get and, and really figure out what's going on. Yeah, so I got to tie this into some, some uh, real-time relevance and I want to get your perspective on this, just how you guys are thinking about it. So the use case of real-time is huge. We were talking about streaming earlier and the modernization of data warehousing. So data comes in two forms in my, the way I look at it. You know, passive data that's stored, I'm monitoring data, I'm pulling and putting into a pile, a corpus, whatever you want to call it, and then active data in real time. So data is changing shape every day. So if I analyze a piece of data, a corpus of data, and there's more data piling in, right. I have to constantly be at a real time 
stream. So, okay, my analysis changes every time new data enters the analysis. So this is a challenge we're seeing, I call the data ocean, which is not a data lake problem. It's more of, you know, more currents, more streaming, more stuff. How do you guys think about that, and how can we get the interactive of the linguistic or the experts, the humans, to solve this? Is it going to come from this kind of system? Because this seems to be the cutting edge problem. I analyze X, but it changes because new data. Right. So, so there's two aspects to that, you know, re responding in real time to new information coming in. And there you, you're looking at, you know, a, a new, new information comes in, but in order to figure out if that's an anomaly or not, you need to have that historical analysis and the profiles built yeah. that, that tells you that it's an anomaly, right? And the second oh, by the way, that's got to be in, you know, low latency performance. Absolutely. Not minutes. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, and the second thing is, you know, incorporating new data into the queue. And there, you know, we, we have the ability to do incremental builds. So as new da data comes in, you know, in, in very, very short periods of time, that can be incorporated into the queue itself. Awesome. And, and, and since we're not sacrificing granularity, you can, that includes time as well, the dimension of time. So you can have very fine-grained mapping of any trend across multiple dimensions and then you can compare what happened here, what happened in this five second interval versus the last one year. So AJ, we're getting the hook here. I want to get, I mean, I want to get your thoughts. What, is this, what does this mean and where is this going to go? I mean, this is cutting edge, it's really great, yeah. and yeah. again, it's high end, but it's self-service BI, so you, it's, it yeah. can be commoditized to the point where citizens, right. normal people could use it. So where's it going? So we, we're really looking at you know, transforming the way uh, business users think of big data. You know, right now it's kind of thought of as a very complex environment. They really don't know how to deal with it. You know, they need some data scientists to kind of figure out how to, you know, analyze that data and really transform that and make it accessible to the business users so they can do self-service interactive analytics right there. So we should contact you when we build our OLAP cube for the cube platform <laughs> we're building. So then it'll be fully cube, cube squared. We can call it, you know, some you know, cube tie-in. <laughs> To our crowd data, we'll call you guys up. <laughs> and how do we contact you? Customers out there saying, hey, I like this conversation. Where do I go to join the conversation? Where do I find information sure. about this? Uh, KaiVosInsights.com is our, is our website. Okay. And, uh, Great. You know. All right, guys, thanks so much for the insight here on the Cube, <laughs> SiliconANGLE's Cube. We are talking about OLAP cubes, bringing the data, making the data work real time, passive analysis, and low, low, low latency performance. I'm John Furrier with Jeffrey. We'll be right back after the short break.